Hi, everybody. This is Brendan Baylot from the Great Lakes Re Shipwreck Research Group. Um, welcome to my uh, my latest video. Um, tonight, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a new resource that's out uh, to help find uh, shipwrecks on the Great Lakes and to do maritime history research. It's really one of the neatest new things that I've seen in a while uh, that's come out on the internet to, uh, related to the Great Lakes. What it is, is it's uh, the historical map and chart collection from NOAA, from the Office of Coast Survey. And for most, most of you who are, you know, uh, boaters will know that NOAA makes all of the uh, nautical charts that we use. Uh, they have since about 1970. Prior to that, the responsibility for Great Lakes nautical charts was uh, the, the purview of the War Department. Um, and then prior to that, in the 1800s, the U.S. Lakes Survey um, was producing uh, charts. Charts are, are really an important resource. Nautical charts, particularly the early ones, don't just show the, you know, the coast or the waterways. They also show, also show the layout of the, the shoreline. They show buildings. They show land use. They show um, all sorts of interesting things. Uh, in some cases, the nautical charts are some of the earliest, uh, you know, uh, civic maps we have that actually show the layouts of towns because the early chart, charts show all the buildings. That, that were there in many of our port cities, uh, particularly early on. And so I'm going to take you on a tour of this uh, really wonderful map collection. Uh, it shows, it has literally every nautical chart um, really ever made for the Great Lakes, uh, not just the early ones. It, you can look at the, the latest nautical charts and go back year by year by year and, and see the evolution of, uh, of our port cities. Uh, using these maps. So it's a fascinating historical thing to do. A um, little bit of history behind maps on the Great Lakes. Uh, the U.S. Lake Survey started in the 1840s, and their goal was to map the entire Great Lakes in you know, at, with accuracy. And they finished that uh, task, I believe, in 1882. Um, that's when the last of what we call the first uh, series of survey uh, charts were finally completed. Now, they did a second you know, series where they remapped in the 1880s, 1890s to the early 1900s. And um, those were even more accurate. And those maps are, are, all of those are highly collectible, you know, especially the second series are really colorful uh, maps, kind of cool looking. And then uh, there were regular maps made throughout the 1900s, uh, usually every, uh, you know, three to five years, and then much more frequently as you get later on. Um, now, one of the interesting things is that these maps didn't have a lot of de detail, uh, and they didn't come out very frequently in the 1800s, uh, for harbors. And so if you were a schooner captain and you needed to know how to enter a harbor at night, the charts weren't particularly useful. You had to use what was called a coast pilot book. And uh, the coast pilot books were really important. And they had their own maps of the Great Lakes, which predated, in many instances, the lake survey. And I just I just wrote an article in um, Inland Seas, the Journal of the Great Lakes Historical Society, about about the Coast Pilot books called the Great Lakes Coast Pilot Wars. It was named so because the the two guys who came up with the concept uh, um, were uh, James Barnett and Thomas Thompson, uh, who went on to found Barnett's Coast Pilot and Thompson's Coast Pilot, respectively, two very collectible books now. The first book they put out, they put out together in 1855, I think, and then the men had a parting of the ways, and they, my story that I wrote tells kind of their 30-year feud over <laughs> who had rights to do it. Uh, anyway, they both had their own books, which were popular in different parts of the lakes, but uh, the Coast Pilot books would tell you, you know, what the lighting configuration was to get into a harbor. If there were any obstructions, it would tell you if there were piers. Um, and it would tell you if there are shipwrecks in the way, which is kind of cool. Uh, those books are really collectible now, and uh, they're pretty cool, and they're good adjunct to using with these historical charts. But anyway, enough history of, uh, of mapping. There are a couple of different ways to use this website to, to you know, look up maps, right? You can do it geographically, pointing at the map and listing the maps for that area, or you can enter a place name um, and then list for that area. So we'll do it geographically first let's uh let's uh pick a place so if i point to the map now we're still far out so i'm gonna uh zoom in a little bit i'm gonna pull that down a little bit I'm zoom in again it's a little a little kludgy but not too bad let's do kiwana bay that'll be a good one um i think 
just sort of choosing that off the top of my head. So, so what you see now is kind of the weakness of, of their search engine, and that's that they have a lot of extraneous stuff in there, and they also bring up any map that ever contained the word Keweenaw, pretty much. So you get many, many, many results down here. And then everything always, for some reason, brings up this nautical index from 47, even though it says the, the title's Milwaukee. Same with this Cleveland Harbor. I don't know why those come up. But let's take a look at what we've got here. So we have the first series, the, the original lake survey map of Key Bay from 1866 it was done. And you'll see if you're on the eastern lakes, some of them are earlier, 1840s. Uh, lake Michigan, I think the Beaver Islands, 18, was 1855. Um, you know, and then the last ones were 1870s and 1880s for some of the more remote parts of the lakes. And as you go down, you can see that they had a second series that they did uh, as it you know, came uh, closer to 1900. They did one in 1897. Uh, and then a few others every every few years. Um, so if you look at the chart numbering um, that they used, the original series, uh, this part of Lake Superior was LS29. And uh, that's you know, LS stood for Lake Superior. When you start getting further, you get there, you, you find that they started to use the War Department numbering. So this was chart number 943 once the War Department took over. And sometimes it would, it would say LS943. But that's the War Department number. Then if we go to the next page of results, you come way down here to the bottom. This is the NOAA number for the chart, uh, which first starts to appear in uh, 1976. And that's 14971. So you can kind of see if you want to trace, you know, if you want to find a, a map and you want to trace it all the way from the first map in the mid-1800s and you want to come up out an era, you have to go through a few different numbering conventions and naming conventions. And I would also give you a couple caveats. One is that the charts aren't exactly the same. They're not going to show you the same exact thing every year. You know, they change the scope of the chart sometimes. So let's take a look at what we get here when we uh, click on uh, the first one, 1866. All right. So it brings up sort of a, 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 a token view of the chart, but you can zoom in on it quite nicely. Um, and uh, you can toggle it to full page. You can rotate the chart. Um, you can go back to your to this view, or you can zoom in and out. And another thing you can do, download an image of this chart. I have to warn you, I, 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 these are big images. Um, this one downloads as a JPEG, and I think some of them you can download as a TIFF. But uh, it downloads at about 13 meg. It's too big to open up in Microsoft Paint. You have to open it up in an editor like GIMP or something like that. But it's nice uh, nice to have a chart if you're interested in it from for historical research to download. But it's prohibitive to download even a, a subset of them because they are big. So let's zoom in. I'll show you what the first lakes, the first series of lake survey charts looks like. So one of the things I like about the early charts is they really did a lot of bottom sampling. When the lake survey came through, they checked depths, they checked what the substrate was like, and they did this beautiful job of showing the vegetation and showing the topography. These people who, who drew these charts were really artists um, in their own right. And here you're going to see something interesting. 1866, they're showing the buildings and they're showing land under agricultural use, which is kind of cool. Here we uh, have uh, the uh, early uh, Keweenaw Bay uh, Indian community and the Roman Catholic mission. And you can see every structure that was there. We come down here and we start to see that, um, you know, really uh, there's not much there at the present day site of Lancer Baraga, literally uh, almost nothing. We come here to uh, Lance, and we see that there was just a sawmill, very little, a little bit of land under agricultural cultivation, and that's it. A few houses up here. So this is sort of cool. Um, here's some more houses. Here we have the Methodist mission, Father Peitzel, who was there. And I think this is Zeba, uh, the present-day community of Zeba. But you get the idea. This is pretty cool stuff. And uh, if we want to go up further, we can see the south entry up here. Um, you get 
the idea that the lighthouse was there already, but there was just a little pier here. This had all changed. This would all change later when they he did the the entry. But this is what um, how to how to navigate around and how to look at these. Uh, very very cool first series chart. Let's uh, let's look at some later ones. So that's 1866. Let's see what the 1897 looks like. Much the same, um, but we're going to see that they've started to uh, to do updates. Um, no, not much different. So they didn't add the town here. They do have the Sandpoint light, but they didn't bother to do any meaningful updates on this chart. And you see that sometimes. So that's an interesting thing to note, that um, even though Lantz and Verga were definitely there by that point, they didn't bother to do much with it. So that chart isn't exactly accurate. Let's go up to uh, 1906. All right. So now we see that they have definitely updated it. Um, we get um, Barraga, Michigan here. And here we have the Nestor Lumber Company docks. Uh, we've got, you know, there's a lot of lumbering going on. You see the whole town has grown up now. Uh, lots of land under cultivation. We see every structure, literally every structure, which is kind of cool. Here's a big log boom that was in existence at the time uh, that they they uh, created this. Oh, this is fascinating. Um, we come down here, and uh, Lance is also a booming uh, enterprise. Um, the shipwreck of the Northerner isn't shown. They didn't show shipwrecks on uh, these early charts, just so you know. If you see you know, an early lake chart like this, you'll never see a wreck symbol. It's very, very rare. Um, the wreck symbol started to show on charts around World War II. Here is a quarry. There was a brownstone quarry here, um, the Lance Brownstone Quarry. I didn't know that. Uh, um, and uh, one of the things I like to look at that's kind of cool here is Pequaming Bay because the um, the Nestor Lumber Company, or I'm sorry, the Hebert Lumber Company had a big dock here for Ford Motor. They all the all the wood that, that would eventually go into all the cars made by Ford came from here. So there was a shingle dock and a crib and uh, Hebert and Son uh, Lumberyard here at Pequaming. A lot of this is gone. There are some shipwrecks here now. There's at least one hull here left over. Um, but you get the idea. Uh, this chart is quite a bit more detailed. It's a War Department chart. And uh, they've uh, shown the improvements here. And you can see that they've actually started to shade in the water. And now they show the Jacobsville um, sandstone quarries here. Submerged wreckage and sandstone blocks. And the blocks are still there. But I didn't know about any wreckage. Um, Peterson's dock, that was a fishing operation. And this is the old uh, uh, pier head light. This has all been changed now. But so you get the idea. Again, very artistically drawn. Um, the colors are really cool. Um, 70 foot high ledge of red sandstone. So very cool chart. Let's take a look at, uh, as we go forward, uh, we're going to go up to 1924. Now you'll see they have two different charts here. Uh, for 1924, uh, they're probably pretty similar. Often you'll see that one is in color and one looks black and white. Um, but so here we're back at, uh, I'll zoom in on Pequaming again, and you can see it's completely changed, uh, the, the layout. This, uh, there's some more docks here. Um, and let's go down and look at the Nestor Lumber Company, Baraga. You can see Baraga has grown. They've updated it. Um, considerably. Um, it's not just sort of a rehash of the previous chart. So that's pretty cool. And then we come down here and we can see the wreck of the northern is shown. That's interesting. Very interesting. Wreck steamer northerner. Very interesting. All right. I'm going to take us up to uh, um, a later chart, one of the modern series. Uh, to 1940, uh, let's do a let's do 49. And the only reason is that I do want to show rec symbols, and they don't always have them um, on the uh, right at World War II. So here we have it at Pequaming. There's a pretty good size rec shown here. 
I've never actually identified that. I'd like to get out there and see what that is. And you're going to see these all over these charts right after World War II. For every port on the Great Lakes, you're going to see wreck symbols, and uh, a lot of them are unidentified. Um, you know, it would be really cool to look into that and see what what these all are um, on all these different uh, on all these um, these maps. All right, let's go down to uh, the Nestor Lumber Company. There should be there's it's not shown on this chart, but there should be a wreck down here too. I think there's a wreck off Baraga. And it's unidentified too. I think it's a little uh, a little tug. And here uh, you can see the wreck of the Northerner shown right here. But uh, interestingly enough, uh, you no longer see all the structures. You know, every little house isn't shown. The uh, land under cultivation isn't shown anymore. Um, they've changed all that. Um, you can see that there are a lot less. Uh, Structure shown here at the mission that in 1866 was pretty prominent. So we'll go up to the north entry. And now you can see that it's a little bit more improved. Um, the wreck of the uh, Alfred P. Wright is shown here. And uh, I think that's the only wreck that they have shown. There actually is a wreck here, the, the Steamer International burn right here. And is uh, on the there's just debris, big debris field right here from the wreck of the International. Uh, there's also some fish tugs that are abandoned in here, but I don't think they they were abandoned yet at that point. So uh, let's go right up to a modern chart now, and uh, I'll show you uh, Keweenaw Bay on a modern NOAA chart. This is 1979, so. Uh, does not want to show us that chart. Let's just uh, try it one more time, and if it doesn't work, once in a while you'll get that. Um, my guess is, there we go. My guess is it was a memory overflow. Well, maybe not. Let's go up one. So that's a caveat. Be aware, you'll you'll see that when you work with these. Try one more. Here we go. Here's a modern NOAA chart. And so we're going to zoom in at Pequaming. And uh, you can see that they don't show the wreck anymore. They call it ruins or submerged cribs. Um, I would like to go out there and dive and see what's, see what's there um, at Pequaming. Um, let's take a look down here. And you can see the nature of the charts has changed quite a bit now. Um, they show a lot less detail than they did back in the early day. So kind of a, a, a significant change. But um, you see the wreck of the Northerner here pretty well, pretty well laid out. So that's an example of how the charts changed over the years. Um, I'll show you one more uh, way to, to find things. I'm going to go ahead and do Beaver Island because there really were a lot of different, and it's gonna, what it does when you enter in a name is it brings up all the different places. And we want Beaver Island, Michigan. Uh, so Beaver Island, Michigan Island. What it does then is it just brings up this selected location view results. You click on view results. For Beaver Island, Michigan. Oh, but I'm still in mapping mode. So I have to get out of mapping mode. So to do that, you have to say remove location filter. That's right. So be aware of that. <laughs> it's really pretty kludgy. All right, we're going to look up Beaver Island. We're going to do Beaver Island, Michigan. View results. Let's do it again. OK, that time we got it. <laughs> All right, so Beaver Island, um, you know, one of the things you would expect to find when we list it out is the, the first series of charts, but the first series wasn't called Beaver Island in, in, in the survey, so you won't see it here. You have to kind of uh, go forward a little bit until you find 
the chart, the earliest chart that contained the rally. And you could also do it by year published, but you're going to get a lot of charts that are not really what you want um, if you if you sort it by year published. So you kind of just have to click through. All right, here we go. The chart I wanted was the 1855 north end of Lake Michigan, right? The first series. So I'm going to go ahead and preview that. This is what it looked like. Um, we're going to zoom in on Beaver Island. And you can see that they've mapped it with really nice uh, detail. So what's cool about this is the Mormons were there at the time. Um, this is, you know, the era when uh, the, the Mormons had uh, set up their kingdom on, uh, on Beaver Island. And it's neat to see the land usage. Um, you can see that there was some uh, pretty decent sized settlement here. The lighthouse was already there on Beaver Island. There was uh, land here under cultivation. And if we come up here to the uh, area around St. James, you can really see that there were uh, uh, houses and uh, quite a bit of land under, under cultivation. And there was a lighthouse. And you can see the, uh, the islands, that there was uh, actually some, um, some settlements starting on some of the other islands as well. Uh, now, Garden Island at that time had a, a fairly good size uh, Indian uh, Native, Native American population, uh, mostly Potawatomi. Um, so that's kind of cool. And you can see um, every place else is really pretty uh, undeveloped, like Sochua Point, the lighthouse shouldn't be there yet. There, there won't be much at all on the North Shore of, uh, of Lake Michigan in 1855. It's really, really quite early. Um, and so it's an excellent way to see what things looked like in a state of nature. Um, even the mainland here didn't have a whole lot. Cross Village perhaps had a few things. Uh, Middle Village. So really uh, a fascinating early reference. Now, if we come up and look at some of the later Beaver Island charts, um, We'll come here to get the actual Beaver Island charts, and we'll look at this one here. There we go. This is 1911. And it's still going to be the first series. We're still going to get that really nice vegetation uh, being shown and the land under cultivation. Um, we're going to get to see structures and, uh, you know, kind of artistic renderings. You don't get to see many shipwrecks until after World War II. So, let's see, LS704, Lake Michigan, 1944. Let's see if this is going to give us, yep, it's going to give us Beaver Island. So what they started to do is they started to inlay some of the harbors in the, the, the later charts like this. So let's go ahead and look at, um, at Paradise Bay is the name of the bay that um, St. James is in. And what we see is that wreck symbols are starting to show up, right? And you can really zoom in on this. Here's a wreck. Um, uh, Oh, her name skips me right now. I know the name of that wreck, the f something Fisher, I think. Another one here, another one here, um, and there should be one over here somewhere too. Uh, but you can get the picture that there were a lot of abandoned vessels there. I think uh, the Waleska was abandoned there, a number of other uh, fairly well-known schooners. And if we come up here, we see the lighthouses here now. They do not show the wreck of the Granger at Port Inland. That wasn't mapped until considerably later. Um, but uh, you get the idea that there are a lot of interesting things shown on even the maps from the 1940s. Uh, and then we'll look at a modern chart of that area. Um, we'll come up to... Let's do 1972. And this one's not in color. I'm not sure why. But you can see now that, um, you know, Beaver Harbor has gotten really developed by comparison. There's a, a underwater cable set running to the mainland now. We've got a number of different shipwrecks. Now we've got one uh, breaking the surface. We've got another one here. We've got one here. We've got one here. We've got one here. We've got another wreck here. And... Uh, 
there should be one over here, but I don't see it. Anyway, um, you can find those, like I say, in just about every harbor on the Great Lakes. You know, uh, Manistique, I know, has, has a ton. Uh, and many other harbors do as well. Have just a lot of wreck symbols uh, showing on these immediate, on, on these, these maps from the 60s and 70s. So um, a good research uh, resource. Um, I'm going to start to wrap it up a little bit because uh, I think those are the main things I wanted to show. Um, this does have maps for pretty much the entire Great Lakes. So I was showing the lakes over there, and it's only got the American Great Lakes, I believe, although it, it'll, it does show, you know, when I say the American, I mean the harbors. Um, if you wanted to look at, uh, let's do some uh, some stuff over here. Let's pick Rochester. I'm going to do this just by selecting the point on the map. Let's see what we get. So, yeah, we get Rochester, um, a detail map from 1937. Very nice. There are a lot of maps on here also, for the record. I mean, just a really large number. Um, and you get to see the detail. And I'm sure you there are other things that will show this in, in, in greater detail, but the Genesee River all the way up, uh, mapped pretty well. And... Uh, this is 1937, so it may not have rec symbols. Um, but if we went a little bit later, I'm sure it would. Um, let's take a look at uh, 1953. Probably not too many abandonments around there. Usually, when you see these uh, these these uh, hull symbols, it's fish tugs that that are are, are sunk. So anyway, um, this is a pretty cool resource. Resource. I mean, you can find just about anything, any part of the lake on here um, real quickly. Uh, the interface is a little kludgy. There's some caveats to using it, but uh, I believe you've got stuff all the way up the St. Lawrence um, on here, uh, as well as in urban areas, uh, uh, some really early charts. Um, I've, I've never done a lot of these, so... If you'll bear with me, I just want to try Detroit one time and see what we get. 1921. Let's see what the earliest one they have is. If we start to... So we can... The Detroit River right up to the modern era, but what we'll get is once we're after the modern era, we should get the early charts. Here we go. Charter Detroit River, 1876 is the first series. Very cool. The City Wyandotte, um, Grassy Island. So you can really see that, um, obviously in 1876, this was already e-course. They show every building. They show that this was farmland. Very interesting. Trenton. One of the things I like is oftentimes it'll show shipyards, you know, where they were. Um, so anyway, very cool. Uh, you get the idea of how useful this is. Oh, look at that. Somebody used cellophane tape. This is why you don't apply 3M tapes to any paper because this is acidified now and it's destroyed the, uh, the paper underneath. All right, I'm going to wrap it up. Um, this is a very useful resource um, for, you know, just about any kind of research, even genealogical, you know, uh, if you want to see where houses were and things like that. Um, if you uh, like this video, uh, uh, go ahead and uh, subscribe to my channel here. I, uh, I'm going to post more things like this uh, with uh, different research resources and giving you, uh, you know, uh, overviews of how to use them. So thank you for watching and uh, have a good evening.